I got an email on my phone, and I thought this would be good to add in. Um, how many of you have read read the little short article in the Brass Playing Book by Larry Miller, where he talks about the diaphragm? Okay, well, in what Larry Miller was a student of Claude Gordon's that is a cardiovascular surgeon out in the San Francisco area. And when he started lessons with Claude Gordon, Claude would always tell people to, to just think about taking a big breath and keeping your chest up. And anything about breathing from the stomach or the diaphragm or anything like that, Claude just said, you know, don't think about that. Just keep your chest up, take a big breath, and there's nothing more to think about. So Larry took it upon himself when he started taking lessons with Claude to, to try to prove whether that was correct or not. He thought he was impressed by Claude and, and said that he thought Claude was, had a very kind of charismatic personality and almost a, a snake oil salesman is what he th said he thought of him at first. And he wanted to know if this was true. So being a, a surgeon and, and operating on people, he'd seen the diaphragm like every single day. And he'd been a, a trumpet major all the, or a trumpet player all the way through school and then stopped when he became a, a surgeon. So then, then he, he took trumpet back up as a hobby and looked around for a teacher and he found Claude. And then this is something that he, he wanted to verify for himself. So at the camp every year, he would do a little lecture about this. And I remember one of my first camps, this was probably 1984, Larry went and brought in an actual actual diaphragm from a cadaver and <laughs> and allowed everyone to put on on surgical gloves and actually handle it. And the point that he was making behind that was to show that it's it's not this muscle that you'd usually think of like your arm that's something really tough and it's really fragile. It was so so fragile that you could just push your finger right through it and tear a hole in it. And if you held it up to the light, you could actually see through it. So just looking at it kind of really changed changed my way of thinking about it. I was thinking that it was like some powerful muscle, like your abdominal muscles. So Larry just sent me an email and said, I hope it's not too late. And here are the pictures that I said I was going to send you a couple weeks ago. So here's what he sent. The, this might make people queasy, but the hole that goes through the... The hole that goes through the middle there is like where your where your um, spine and your aorta and all the all the things pass through your diaphragm. And your diaphragm, most of you probably know this, but it's basically in the middle of your body that's separating your lungs from your your intestines and all that part of you. And then here's a, a close up of it. Here's another one. Here's another one. And there's another one, but you can you can see that it's it's kind of translucent where you can see through it. So hope that you'll find that interesting. I had an idea I actually had an idea that that was pretty strange. I called up I was gonna try to get try to duplicate that. I called up the a friend of mine that's a, a surgeon asked him if I could get one from like a experimental thing. He said they don't do that anymore. It's against the law. And then I talked to someone that was, uh, I, I called up the coroner in the morgue and asked, is there a way to do this? And they said, no, no, you, it's against the law. So, so this is the closest thing I can come to doing this. <laughs> Close enough. Okay, so the, the, last, the last lecture I'm going to talk about is practice routines. Now, it's in, in 10 years of taking lessons, I'm trying, what I was trying to do is distill this all down to just basic principles so that you can take any kind of books. It's not just Clark Gordon books, but a whole bunch of different books and try to organize the routines in a way that kind of gels with the, these seven items that we're talking about. So we're talking about practice routines. Now, the reason for having practice a practice routine is a couple things. If, if you've got something that's written down and that you do on a consistent basis, you're able to gain consistency so that you know it's the same thing every, every day, at least for whatever, a couple weeks or a month or however long you stay on the particular elements in the routine. And then that makes it to where your playing can achieve consistency. And then you, and then you make progress so you can tell that you're moving through various books. You can, you can 
take yourself from one part in one book to another part. And then it also gives you a way to do to um, have a diary or history of, of what you've been doing. And then you can go back and study it. Now, as a teacher, what, what's beneficial about that for me is I'll keep a, a written record of my own personal practice routine, and I can tell these things have helped my playing out in a certain way. Or if I feel like, you know, something's not happening, I'll go look through what I've been doing the past few weeks or months or whatever and and reevaluate it and say, okay, I think maybe I should change directions on this one part. What's also nice is all the assignments that, that I ever had from Claude Gordon are in a binder. So every once in a while, maybe once a year, I'll flip back through it and, and try to study which books we were using in what order and what sequence we went through it, how we combined them together, and try to remember what I was doing at the time, what changed in my playing, and, and try to link the two saying, okay, I think these things helped me out. And then when I'm doing things in the future, I know how better to plan for that. So that's that's why it's good to have it written down. Then this next slide is, I, I took this brass pedagogy class from Claude Gordon. There was about five people that were in the class. Um, the, I mean, I know the names. One was a guy named Scott, Scott Wright, who's a, a freelance player in Los Angeles. He plays studio sessions and, and plays with Letterman and I don't know if anyone has ever seen the show, but he used to play with the monkeys when they'd go on tour. And he does a lot of other things, but Scott's a really great guy. Then there were two horn players in the class. One was a guy named Brad Kincher, who's a studio musician, and his, and his wife, Casey. And then there was another friend of mine, Rich Hoffman, who's now a trumpet teacher at Cal State Northridge. And let's see, Doug Johnson, who's a guy that was, was like a... Uh, worked at a university in the copy room and picked up trumpet as a hobby and eventually started playing professionally. And all of us had taken about five to ten years from Claude at that point. And he was trying to show us how to how to teach. And in a one-year course, we'd meet each month for probably like five or six hours. And he'd go through a topic and we'd have question and answers on it. He'd give us tests. And then we'd go around the room, and each of us, we'd go through the answers. And he'd say, okay, what was, what's your response to this? And if it wasn't right, he'd say, no, that's not right. And then everyone else would try to, try to say what they think was wrong with it and what, what they might do. And then, so it was a really interesting thing. Then at the completion of it, he gave this certificate. Now, the certificate in and of itself it's just a piece of paper. But one of the things that I always think about when I look at it, it's up on my wall, it's got this little phrase on there where it says, with the personal use of these principles is hereby qualified to teach correctly. The, the point I always think about is personal use. And as a teacher and as a player, all this is just information. And in, unless I've got it like worked into my own playing and can understand how to, how to work it in my playing, it's not really any good. So... I think playing the trumpet and developing on the trumpet is different than any other kind of thing that you can learn. I mean, I, I tell some of my students that it's not, it's not like a, a history class or something like that where you memorize facts and it's in your brain and it just comes back out when you need it for the test. You have to be able to make your instrument play and you have to know what it feels like and how to make it behave in different situations. So same thing with teaching. Now, to go over the seven items, we've got these seven items. And the way I think is smart to do things is rethink the seven items and make a list of those and then go through all the kinds of, all the kinds of exercises and pieces of music and every possible thing that you can play. So, like, here's, here, there's, like, a dilemma. Like, here would be all the kinds of things that you could play on, on the trumpet or any brass instrument. You could add to it more. So you've got this big conglomeration of of things that you've been practicing, but you can think about how they would line up with with what what these seven items are. Like for example, uh, double tone that would be working on the attack, and so you could group them all in a category like double tone, single tone, triple tone, and group and group them in a section or 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 the lip slurs would be in the in the tongue level category. So 
you could list off various books and figure out how that matches up to the different items and how you would touch on those seven items at least at some point in your daily practice so that it, your practice is not all lopsided on one thing. Like the practice shouldn't all be about high notes or, or pedal tones or whatever. It should be touching everything you need. This next slide is, is, a, is an actual scan of, of a practice assignment that Claude would give out to everyone. You notice at the top it says breathing exercises. The reason why that was there is like everyone slacks off on breathing exercises. When I took from him, what would happen every once in a while was I'd be, I'd be in a lesson, and sometimes the lesson would get interrupted briefly by a phone call. Someone would call up on the telephone, and they might have a problem and, and need, need to ask them a question. And every single conversation basically started like this. He'd answer the phone, oh, hi, how, whoever it is, and he'd wait for a second, and he was talking to him, and you could tell they were probably asking him or telling him something. And his first thing that came out of his mouth was, are you doing your breathing exercises? And there was this long pause. So you can probably, they probably weren't. And then, so that was the main thing that you always stress first. Because most of us, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. And we just don't do it. But it, that's very important. So that's why that's at the top. Then as you go down the list, there you'll see there's like manuscript, tongue level, all these different sorts of things that are beginning they kind of fall into the category of flexibility and lip slurs. The thing where it says number one, that's kind of fifth on the list there, that's handwritten, that'd be like scales and technical ex technical exercises. And then the last thing, that SA thing stands for systematic approach, which is basically the range study stuff that we demonstrated yesterday. Now, so you could you could devise your own way of writing out your practice routine. It doesn't have to have a form like this, but the general idea is having something that's written down in a structure so that you can track your, your practice through, a, through a, a number of weeks or months or whatever. One of the things that's related to wind power is not having fear when you play. I mean, um, how many of you, or I think most of you came to the concert last night. You could tell when Harry was playing the trumpet, there's no fear in his playing. You look at anyone that's, that's a great player, they're, they're not holding back. They're not afraid that they're going to miss a note and they're not playing timid. And that, that comes down to, to wind power. And when you're playing and practicing your trumpet, you, gotta, you have to make that happen in, in your practice, too. So that also goes along with taking a big breath and, and keeping your chest up and blowing really strong. So here's, here's a clip of Claude telling a story about when he was taking a lesson with Herbert O. Clark. You have to have an attitude like an athlete because brass playing is a form of athletics. You've got to whip every bit of fear out of your system. You cannot be afraid. Don't be afraid of a conductor. You respect him because he's got a job, but don't be afraid. You pick up that horn and play it. You've got to whip all fear out of your system. Now, it takes a lot of hard work and practice. And when I talk about getting rid of the fear. That takes hard work and practice. Boy, Herbert Clark demonstrated this to me so well that I'll never forget it. Here I was, taking a lesson, standing there, playing very timid, and it says in the book, double piano. So I'm playing softly. I don't want to get him upset because here's this great artist that I've heard of all my life, and I'm standing right beside him. So I his horn I'm playing. All of a sudden he stopped and he said, would you put some air through that horn? I said, I'm blowing. He says, you're not blowing. You think you are. And he, boy, he was developed. He had a chest like this. And when I turned to look at him, he swung that chest around. And he hit me with that chest and pushed me so hard, flat on my back on the floor. Oh, my gosh, what's happened? I got my horn protected. And then I stood up and straightened my coat and whop, he brought that chest around and I went down again. Now I got up this time, I'm a little careful. I'm backing away. And he's following me. Every time I got close to him, or he got close to me, because he's following me, he bumped me with that chest. He knocked me down all around that room, which was a big room. When I finally got back to my stand, I stopped and I was a little shaky and I, I didn't know what to do. And he said, now that's the way you play that thing and don't you forget it. 
In other words, you put some air in it. Now, if you're going to try to play softly at the start, you're going to be holding back, holding back, and you won't blow. And that's what I was doing. Boy, that taught me right then, you better take a breath and blow. You can get the soft later. First of all, you have to blow. Okay, so the point isn't, isn't blasting all the time, but the point is the wind power. And like we were saying yesterday about the control, you first have, the, have to have the power before you can develop the control. So these things with breathing exercises, that's how you develop the, that's how you develop the power. And the long, hold, the long hold notes that we were talking about yesterday where you squeeze all the air out until, until the note stops and you still have some more, that builds up the muscles that you use to blow. And then when you have the strength, then you can actually play even softer because you've got more strength to work with. Um, the next thing that would, that would happen after the breathing exercises in the routine would be flexibility. And, and there, there are lots of different exercises that are out there for flexibility. Earl Irons lift flexibilities, Walter Smith lift flexibilities, Charles Cohen advanced lift flexibilities, the Del Stegers book, Schlossberg, there are sections out of the Arvin book. St. Jacome has some scattered sections with it. And then there, there are lots of different books that are out there. You should own all kinds of books like that and put that at the first part of your practice routine. It might be 15 minutes of it. It might be an hour of it. But have at least some of that so that that starts your routine. And I, I compare it to like doing stretching. If you're doing any kind of a sport, you do stretching and it, and it kind of loosens you up so that you can maneuver around your horn and you reacquaint yourself with where the notes are on your horn every day. One of the things that when we were out to dinner with Harry a couple nights ago, he was talking about how every day when he picks up his horn, he feels like he's rediscovering how to find things and play it. And it might start off and it might not feel as great at the, at the very first note and then as he's going along he adjusts and gets used to where things are and then it's everything seems like it's normal and you're working for that field to where things feel like they're working easy and you can coordinate your air and your tongue level and everything well the the flexibility stuff with with that we were talking about that's where you really can kind of get that going at the first part of your practice routine now the term models this is where in in the assignments you'd want to use models. Models is a term that Claude would throw out. That would be, it's basically different articulations. And this is really valuable because what you're doing is you're training your tongue to function under any kind of situation, whether you're slurring to a note or tonguing it or doing a K tongue on it or you know all these different combinations so that then your tongue level and your air know exactly what to do. So then it's like you're programming your body to work the right way under all these situations. Then when you're reading a piece of music, everything just works the right way because you've, you've made it work the right way. So it does a couple things. It makes it to where you're basically ensuring that you're, you're going to have accuracy. Now, examples of where you can find models are like in, this is a page from Arvin, uh, page 125, where it's got intervals. But sometimes people don't look at the bottom of the page where he has some models listed where you can do it single tongue, do it slur two up, slur two down, slur all. You can even add, add additional models to that. This next page is from a book that Claude Gordon wrote called, or that he wrote called um, 30 Velocity Studies. If you look through the book, I, I, there's a couple copies that we have over there. Um, it's basically the hand and piano studies that are written in, in a key that's appropriate for the, or keys that are appropriate for the trumpet. And they start around pedal C and they work up chromatically. But in the first part of the book, he's got a list of about 15 or 20 models there where you'll do it like slur two, tongue two, tongue two, slur two, slur groups of four, all these different combinations. And what you can do is play it through with one model one day and another one the next day. And by doing that, you get it to where you're, flex where you're uh, I'd say, flexibility in a different way that you're you're easily able to adapt to any other kind of articulation. So then if you're if you're reading something in a piece of music, you're not you're not thrown off by the articulation being unus unusual because you can do it with any articulation that that might come up. Um, then in this next one at the bottom of the page comes from Clark's setting up drills. And at the bottom of it you can see he's got it's those chromatic exercises which are kind of like Clark's technical studies number two. 
but he's got some models down there, like double-tongued and various things like that. And another thing I'd point out on the same page is up there where it's got the fermata. Now, Clark Gordon wasn't, wasn't he didn't invent this long hold idea. In the setting up drills, this, this long hold is right in the book where Clark was telling him to hold the note until all the air is gone and longer. And, and, and you can see it right there. So that's, that's interesting. Now the next thing is working on K-tonguing by itself. Clark also had this in his in his technical or in his characteristic studies book. This is from from I can't read the page, but looks like page six or eight in the characteristic studies book. But you can tell he's got K-tonguing by itself. Now, what's interesting that that Harry and Susan talked about was the amount of K-tonguing that Claude had people do. And it wasn't just to give you something else to do, it was to develop something you're playing. We would go through the Clark's technical studies, like starting at the beginning, doing the first week, doing it, doing study number one, all single-tongued, with a K-tongue modified sort of single-tonguing. Then doing the second week, all K-tongued. So you go through the whole thing like that. Then the third week, trip or double-tongued, then the fourth week, slurred. And then we go to Clark's 2, do it the same way. So you're going through Clark's 2, going like... And just going through the whole thing. And your goal is to try to make the K-tonguing to where it's so clean that no one could tell that you're doing it. And what happens by doing that is it changes the way you single-tongue. So it... And Claude wouldn't necessarily explain this to people until... They'd been doing it for a while, and then they started noticing things in their playing starting to change. And they'd say, see, that's, that's what's happening is your single tonguing is switching to be more like the K-tongue modified sort of thing. But that's one of the values of doing the models. So if you just overlook the models and just play it just one time through, you're going to miss a whole lot. Now, another book which I think is the best example of, of using models is St. Chacom. And how many of you own St. Chacom? Cool. That's awesome. Well, in St. Chacom, on page 157, there are all these models. So if you look at the first line, it's or the first three lines, that's the exercise. But all the models, like the different rhythms that are there and, and slurring patterns, you can even add more to it. Like one of the assignments that Claude would give all the students was to write down your own models, as many as you want. I think I came up with about like 20 other models. And you go through doing that too, and then doing them with a metronome. And, and you're trying to play each of them really clean. And if you work through the book like that, it my, I've gone through the St. Chacombe book a couple times, and it takes, it takes a really long time. I'd probably spend a week on the first three lines with all the models. I might spend two weeks like that with a metronome on it, doing each one of them and trying to push the speed up to where I can get them very accurate. And over over the course of of a week or so, make significant progress on it, then move to the next one and do it. it. I think when I did like those six or six to eight pages, it probably took took a, probably like eight months to get through that, which seems really kind of crazy to take that long. But at the end of it, the thing that I always get out of it is that it improves my accuracy to where I hardly have to think about anything. I know that I'll never never crack or miss a note that's in the middle range or, you know, in the normal playing range on your horn. That That's such a valuable section of the book. And there's the next page of it where it's got the variations on the variations and all the different models. And then I was going to list specific books that you can work on for the, for the tongue level and what to practice. Like, here's the Daily Trumpet Routines. That's a good book. It's one of the books that I like to start most all my students with pretty soon because it's pretty easy to get through and it starts out in the low register and they're pretty simple. And if you play all the models, the, the students will usually really notice something within probably, by the time they get to about, you start in lesson three and by the time they get to maybe lesson six or lesson eight, they can really tell that this is starting to change, change the way they play and their playing will get more comfortable. But you have to do the accents on the upper note, and you have to think about the E syllable on the upper note, so you're thinking ta, ti, ta, ti, ta, ti, ta. But if you just play them all the same volume level, like ta, ti, ta, ti, you won't 
get the right feel. So that's in the directions in the book. But again, most people don't read the directions. So I'd say read the directions in every book that you get. Even if you might not agree with it, it's good to get the information and know how the guy thinks. Then here's some other books like Walter Smith's Lift Flexibility book, Cohen's Advanced Lift Flexibility, Iron's 27 Groups of Exercises, Del Steger's book. The Del Steger's book is out of print. So I would say look on eBay, look in old music stores, try to track it down because it's not, it's not a very big book. It's probably maybe 15 pages long, but it's a good book to have in your library. Um, St. Jacome, um, that one section on page 157 goes through 166, and that's with all those models. But also earlier in the book, there's if, if you thumb through the St. Jacome book, what I think is good to have a plan with is to try to figure out how to group the different exercises into categories. Like pages 15, 19, 24, 49, 68, and 81 are really like a series of exercises. The difference between the St. Jacome book and the, and the Arvin's book is that I think Arvin did a better job of arranging things in categories where St. Jacome maybe just threw the book together in a way that he might assign a student. Well, if you know that going in, into the book, then you can figure out how to use bits and pieces of the St. Jacome book to make it work in your practice routine. So I, one of the first things I'd say to do is work on these, these pages that start around page 15 and do that group of exercises slurred and tongued. In the book, it only has tongued. And also in the book, it only has open or first valve. But I think you should do it with all the fingerings. So that, I mean, it, it seems like that should have been printed in the book, but St. Jacob didn't write it. Then some other things. Uh, Tongue Level, that's a book by Claude Gordon. And there's this, this last book I listed there, Flex Tongue Build. Masashi Sugiyama was a student of Claude Gordon that was from Japan. And he wrote a book maybe in the past couple of years that's that's pretty interesting that that is a I would compare it to like a combination of Walter Smith Lip Flexibilities and and Charles Cohen Lip Flexibilities, where it goes a little bit higher and it's got some different patterns like that, and it's it's a fun little lip flexibility book to play. There's another guy that wrote one called Bai Lin, he's from China. And it's also a nice lift flexibility book to play. And when you're putting this into a practice routine, what I would do is start working through one of the books, like maybe Walter Smith, and start at the first part of the book, add a little bit more to where you can play maybe like three or four of them at a time, and then work through the book. And once you get through that, go to another book and start working through it. And you get through the list, and then after a year or two, go back through the list again and work through it. And then what you'll notice new things that you develop each time you go through that cycle through the books. And then just because there's there are these books out there doesn't mean that you have to stop with that. You can come up with your own handwritten material, whether it's for flexibility or or something else like tonguing. This is an example of, of something that Clark Gordon wrote out for a tonguing exercise that I went through at one time. You can tell like the first part of the page, that's what he gave the the first month or so, and then he added to it, and it, you know, went higher and had bigger intervals. And but one of the things I think is is important is to be creative in your practice and in your teaching. One of the things that that is interesting for people to know is that Claude never set out to write a book. Um, the systematic approach book came about because several of his students had been taking from him in. I think it was in the 50s, and they said, you know, this is really great stuff. It's helped out my playing, and you should make a book because you, uh, other people would like to get this. So he took some of these these papers and assembled them in an order with the systematic approach book with 52 of these assignments. And there's the range studies there in that book, but then what's also valuable is the is the is what he mentions in regards to the book that, books that should accompany those assignments. And, and that's really where some of the value is in that book, where it's showing you how to put things together. But what's my main point is that you, you should try to come up with other flexibility studies on your own, like whether you take them from trombone or French horn or other lip flexibility books that you might find, 
or maybe come up with some pattern that that nobody else has done and work it out and play it in all the different fingerings and then that will help your playing out. And what what was interesting several months ago or a couple years ago now is when Harry and I first started talking about doing this, he he sent me all of his practice assignments from Claude Gordon. I scanned them, put them in my computer and and looked at about three and a half years of, of material. And in that, there were some of the books, like Daily Trump Routines, that hadn't even been written yet. And what I found interesting was to see how Claude laid it out in a certain order, and he was trying to be systematic to where you would start with something easy and work to the next hardest thing, and then the next hardest thing. And there was a point where he, he actually, I could see in Harry's assignment where he did one thing, and then another thing later, and I could tell those parts eventually became the daily trumpet routines, but they were assembled in a slightly different order. So in your teaching, you could do something like that too and say, okay, I'm going to try this. And then as you go on, you figure, well, it might work better to start with this and do this in this order with a student. And each student's different, so you might use something slightly different. But figuring out an order to go from easiest to hardest is good because it's not all it's not beneficial to just play something that that's really hard because you're going to get more benefit from playing the easier things well so that you train things to work correctly and easily instead of pushing yourself to where you're starting to develop bad habits then the next section would be on fingers and this could be this could be the Clark's technical studies um, I I tend to I think that it'd be important to go through things in this order I usually want all my students to have their chromatic scales down first. That's the primary thing. If they can play the chromatics, that's that's real important. And right behind that is all the major scales. And I would work through the sections that I have Arvin, like around page 76 is where it starts, work through all the chromatics and then the chromatic triplets, and also in the Arvin book in the major scale section around page 59, and work through that, and then the the minor scale stuff on page 75. Once you complete that, then I think it would be appropriate to go to, to the Clark's Technical Studies. And maybe not starting the Clark's Technical Studies book with the models first. But the idea is that you're working through things in, a, in an order from, from the easiest to the hardest. And then with Clark's, the Clark's Technical Studies book is kind of an ongoing thing. I once had a friend that, or actually the guy that I mentioned that was in the Brass Pedagogy class, Rich Hoffman, he was telling me, be, telling me about how he took from a teacher that said, oh yeah, we worked, we worked through the Clark's Technical Studies book. We're done with it. And I'm like, I, I don't think we're ever done with the Clark's Technical Studies book because each time you go through it, there's some other level of understanding you can pull out of it, whether it's better breath control or, or getting some more of these awkward fingerings to, to work better on your horn. There's a whole bunch of different things. You can do it double tongued and, and coordinating your tonguing with with the different patterns. There's a lot of different things you can get out of it. So, my my um, usual pattern is to try to work through the Clark's technical studies at least once a year. And I did that with Clark Gordon. It might be maybe like three months out of the year, but at least make a pass through the Clark's technical studies once a year. Then alternate fingerings. Now alternate fingerings are really valuable. You'll, you'll find some of these, probably about three-fourths of them listed in the, for the Clark's Technical Studies book, listed in the Systematic Approach book. This is a valuable thing about Systematic Approach. Probably around like lesson six or eight, where the, start, where the Clark's Technical Studies book gets introduced, he mentions all these fingerings. Now, they aren't optional. Um, sometimes the, turn, the tune term alternate fingerings make makes people think that you just play them whenever or some of the time. But when we went through these, every single time we played the Clark's book, it was with those fingerings. And some of them are, are really, really aggravating at times. Like, for example, in, in Clark's 4, where you're doing the trill thing, going like A to B, instead of doing A and B like that, we would do A with, sec with third valve to B with second and do that. You'd never do that in a performance, but we'd work through that in all those like and by doing that it it does a couple things it it makes it to where you're 
your fingers get get to where they're more independent of each other so that your third valve can function just as well as the first or second valve fingers. And then when you run across a difficult passage, that's going to be cleaner. And what it also does is it familiarizes you with, with other fingerings. Uh, some of the alternate fingerings will be easier. Like, for example, um, there's a fingering that you'll find in, in Clark's 2 where it goes like B, C, and it goes like C sharp, D sharp, and E with third valve. Da 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 da. -da. That's actually in Clark six. Da 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 da. -da. And that is actually an easier fingering to do, as opposed to the normal fingering be like C sharp. Da 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 da. With first and second. But as you work through the book with these fingerings, they get to where they become more instinctual, and then then you're playing, and they just start happening when you need them. So that's that's an important thing. Then here are some books that you can use to work on that. I mentioned some of them. And some of these, like the Ernest Williams book is still in print. The Gotti book, is, Gotti Method is out of print with the Carl Fisher edition. You can sometimes find it on eBay or you can find it in, in an old music store that might have it sitting around. Um, there is an edition of the Gotti Method that's that's um, published by Ricordi out of Italy. Um, it's the only thing that makes it hard for me when I use that with a, with students is it's not the page numbers don't don't agree. So if I'm looking at my Carl Fisher edition, it doesn't line up with the with the Ricordi edition. And I think they recently put it out with English text, but it used uh, up until just a couple of years ago, it only had Italian text in it. So you'd want to look for the English version. Aaron Harris Advanced Studies is an etude book that not I don't think so many people use use so much anymore. Does anyone has anyone ever used that book? Aaron Harris? Cool. One person. I, I like that book because it works through a sequence of of all twelve keys and it's got a technical it's got scale studies with different articulations on them and then a longer etude. And it's pretty rewarding because you work through some keys that you don't necessarily work on all the time. The Vizzuni method has some different the different scale patterns and things that are kind of like Clark's technical studies, but but done by Alan Vizzuti in kind of a unique way to where they're they're really kind of challenging for the low register stuff. The world's method is a book that also went out of print probably in the late late eighties. You can sometimes track that down on eBay. And then the next section in the routine would be etudes. And in the etudes section, like I would list it off where you'd start flexibility, intervals, some, then the finger stuff we were talking about, and then etudes and music would all fall in the next section. And, and then here is, here's another quote that I'll play for you. Now, one of the great masters said, without technical proficiency, there can be no music, which means you must learn to play that instrument correctly. We talked about the range study and demonstrated that yesterday. So that, that would be the last component of your practice routine. The, the important thing about putting it at the end is that, that you would, you want to do that because after it you need to take an hour rest. And for most people, including myself, I it works best to put it at the end because it could be your last thing of the day and then you don't have to wait an hour before you do the next thing. For other people that their schedule might be different, you could put it as the first thing in the day and then take an hour break and then start up with the flexibility study. In the range study books, you can, you can all, the velocity, the 30 velocity study book also is kind of the next step after you go through the systematic approach book. Okay, so here's some guidelines about about principles that I think you should think about. I said that the you want the routine to be balanced. You don't want to have it to where it's just all flexibility studies. You don't want to have it to where it's just all range studies. You also don't want to have it to where you end up playing a range study when when you didn't realize it. I made a mistake at one point where, and I realized this because it was written down. I was playing playing through my routine, and I was playing the Charles Cohen lip flexibility book doing 3, 5, 9, 14, which goes up to an F sharp. Then I was going to the next section, 
where it does these lip trills. I was taking up to about a double A. Felt great for about a week or two. And then I was going on, I'm like, man, I'm feeling stiff and it doesn't feel so good. And then I was doing Clark's technical studies after that, going up uh, like study nine, going chromatic up to like a G, and then playing some etudes, and then going to a range study. Well, it was, go it was going along pretty good. After these two weeks, I started feeling stiff. Things didn't work. And I looked over my routine, and I was like, this is kind of dumb. I'm doing three range studies. Why am I doing this? So I went back and didn't play some of the colon stuff as high, didn't play some of the Clark stuff as high, and then all of a sudden, everything got better. My range study went higher, and I didn't feel stiff. It was because I was way out of balance on what I was doing, but I wouldn't have discovered it if I wouldn't have written it down. And so that's an advantage of having it written down. And you're working for a correct feel. Your, your goal is that things will feel fresh or easy or where... The way I describe it is, if you know, it's like when you just warm up, like the first five minutes or so, and everything's feeling like it's working really good, you want that feeling all the time in your practice. So when you make it to the very end of your practice, if you don't feel like that, you need to add in some more rest or change parts of your routine so that that's happening. Same things with your students. So, so if, if you don't hear that happening, what I usually try to figure out with my students is, are they resting enough? Are they doing all the routine? Are they skipping parts of it? Because if they're just doing parts of it and not doing the other parts, it will give them the wrong feel and it won't help them out because it's out of balance. Then accuracy. The ac accuracy when you're playing exercises like Clark's or the intervals is always the most important thing. It doesn't matter that you play them super fast. Um, the reason why is because if you're trying to do something like the Clark's technical studies in, in some of the breath control things like Sean did yesterday where he played um, etude five in one breath, you have to first be able to play it accurate because if your fingerings aren't really clean and accurate, you're going to be wasting a lot of your air and then it hurts your breath control. So it's kind of like I, if I listed things in a sequence, I'd say accuracy is most, most important, then speed, and then the end result of that is breath control. It's kind of like one builds to the next one. But if you get so consumed with trying to play it really fast or a bunch of times in one breath, you're not going to be able to do anything. You're just going to be sloppy and you don't get the benefit of, of the exercise. Then progress, like I was saying before, if you if you have your routine to where it's going from one point to the next, where it's not just stagnant and staying on the same exercises. And another trait to have is patience. Sometimes if you're, if you're playing through, like I mentioned earlier, playing through an exercise and it takes you eight months on the same exercise for something to click, it, it's good to have that much patience to stick with something to see that progress. One of the ways to measure is with a metronome. So if you're doing Clark's and you've got your metronome out and you're trying to play it at a certain speed and you turn it on one click faster and it's just sloppy, well, you might have to turn it back, get it clean, and then wait a while, do it more times until you can finally move it up. If you just give up on it before, you've, before that happens, you haven't gotten the benefit of it. Then rest. The thing that Claude would say is rest as much as you play. That's so that so that you don't feel tired, so you keep this feel we're talking about. That's so important. There's some things that that I remember reading that I always I find interesting if th the similarities between different people. Um, uh, reading the, the autobiography of, of Herbert L. Clark, it's called How I Became a Cornetist. You can find it on the internet, it's free. Um, I have a link to it up on my site, but it's posted around the internet. And there used to be a little booklet that uh, Holton would give out to people for free. And also the Timothy Dockshitzer biography and Rafael Mendez's book, they basically say that their resting, learning how to rest was a big factor in their playing. Um, Clark talks about that's one of the things that he thought improved his tone. And, at, and in his book, he says that it took him till he was 33 before he felt he learned how to play the cornet. Now he was already recording all these solo things and touring with Sousa when he was about 19. But one of the things that he talks about is learning how to rest. So resting is such a big deal that I, mean, I have to mention that. Then there are different variations on doing the routine.
You could have it in the structure like we're talking about, or you could do it a couple different ways. There'd be what I call a Clark day, an AB day, or an ABC day. Now what a Clark day is, that's where you could do like the regular routine structure, and then on the, op on the other day, like every other day, you'd switch to Clark, and you might play Clark's one, one, two, three, and four on that day. Then you go back to a regular routine. Do that for a while, and then you might go one, two, three, four, five, six. Eventually, it could work up to where you're doing the entire Clark's book. Now, that might be a bit much for some people, but eventually that's obtainable. Like if you're playing the Clark's book, you can probably get through it once you're used to it in maybe like three and a half hours if you're playing it pretty fast. But the point is that that it's a that you're building up to something like that. It might take several years to do that. Then the A B day thing, what that's about is that you would have the routine where it might have certain things on one day and another on the other day. Like for example, you had flexibility more on one day and the and then on the other day it would have the range study. So that you're only doing the range study every other day. Then the ABC idea is to where you'd have the range study on one day and then something else on the other two days and you're kind of cycling through more things. For some people's schedule that allows you to actually get through more material but you can't miss a day because it'll, it'll be a lot longer before you get back to the other stuff. Then the idea about missing days. Sometimes, sometimes people with, with their practice think that it's okay to skip days. And I know that everyone miss, misses days, but being, being regular and disciplined with your practice is a really valuable thing. When I was taken from Claude, he told us that I think he went something like 15 years without missing a day's practice. And, and I thought it was not possible, so, but several of us attempted to see how far you could go. So I, I encourage people to try this. Like keep a record and see how many days has it been since I've since I've missed a day's practice. With myself, it took probably about 90 days to where it felt like it was a habit. After the first 30 days, it felt like uh, something would come up. Like you know, something in your schedule comes up. You get sick. You don't feel so good one day. But but then once you kind of make it past that, it almost feels like it's such a habit that you just feel like you have to do it and you can't get away from it. That's what you're going for with your attitude about it. Now, with Claude, I asked him, do you, did you do the entire routine every day? And he said, no. I mean, that's you don't have to do everything but to do something every day. So I was saying, is it okay to miss days? No, but here are the exceptions. And when you have the exceptions, like your schedule, the way you can work your routine is you could narrow it down to just a couple things. Like I'd say flexibility, pedal tones, and, and finger exercises. Now this could be really brief. Like you could just play a couple, a couple exercises out of, out of like the Walter Smith Lip Flexibility book. Like you could maybe do Smith number one, two, three, and four. Probably get that done in, in like 15 minutes. Maybe do one of them slurred, then number two tongued and alternate to speed things up so you get a little bit of variety. Then pedal tones, you could just do the part one of systematic approach number one where it's got these arpeggios going down the pedals. And then finger exercises, you could do Clark's technical studies number two, tongued and slurred, just alternating back and forth. You could probably get, get through this in about 30 minutes and you'd feel like you'd accomplish quite a bit. The last thing I was going to say is you don't want to make excuses about about things in your playing. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I think is, is really interesting, that, that you look at someone, someone like Harry Kim, and I don't know if anyone knows this, but he, he was telling us last night that, that he said his chops felt terrible. He was like, oh man, I'm not playing good, I feel terrible. Well, you couldn't tell it. I mean, when you heard the concert, I mean, how, I mean, he didn't show it. So I think with some of that is you, this idea about not having fear, not, not making an excuse for yourself, and just playing and making it work and having confidence when you play is, is one of the biggest things. And that all comes back to wind power and how you use all this. Now, any last minute questions? Go ahead. Going back to the missing days, um, I pretty much got to the I don't miss days. Sometimes I feel like I should. I think there's something going on with my practice routine where I'm inconsistent. I'm playing as far as the way things feel. Um, 
what my range is on any given day, and sometimes the, the quality of the, of the tone production. Sometimes it seems like I should take a day off to recover, or should I adjust the routine to where it's less demanding, where I'm still working, but it's recovering at the same time. Yeah, what, what I would say is like, Having it written down, you can kind of figure out if it's if it's maybe out of balance, which is might be causing it to feel that way. And then the other thing would be, yes, it's a, it's okay to change the routine. I asked Claude about this. What do you do if you're starting to feel stiff? Do you just keep plowing through the routine and making it worse and making yourself feel terrible, or or do you change something? And he said, well, sometimes all he would do is just start on Clark's Clark's one and play it just at a medium speed, medium volume, just up to the middle C in the staff, and that's it. Put his horn away. Just enough to kind of touch base with the horn and just play it where all the notes are responding really good and put his horn away. Now, other days it might feel like you'd play, play a, like the systematic approach part one where it's just like a warm down, and then you put your horn away. Or it might feel good to play just Clark's two, slurred and tongued. But the point is to kind of learn from yourself. You figure out what, what you need to make it work in that situation and adjust it. And then that's how you can get the most out of the idea of having a routine. So you're saying it's better to adjust a given day rather than to take a day off? Yeah, because my experience is if you take a day off and you're already feeling stiff, you come back the second day or the next day and you'll feel worse. It'll be like it'll be even more stiff. Where if I played something like, like a, a down routine thing where it loosens me up, then at least I've kind of gotten things working and limbered up, and then I just stop where, at that point where it feels good, and then just have patience and wait for the next day. Yeah, but you, yeah, because you're. I mean, think about it, you're either training good habits or bad habits. So if you if you repeat something and you're tired and you keep missing and you do it over and over and over again, you're teaching yourself to miss. So if you take a part of what, like, say, if it's a big etude or something like that, or or a piece that you're working on, if you take a little part of it and work that part out really well at whatever speed you need to be able to play it accurate, and and get that accomplished, then the next day maybe do another part and eventually put it all together to where you've, you've got it. The, the idea is the accuracy is more important than just playing through the material at whatever speed or because accuracy is like the most important thing. Uh, we got we to gotta go. One more question. Okay. Um, what should be the frequency of your trumpet lesson? You mean like taking trumpet lessons with someone? I mean, it all kind of depends what your situation is with your teacher. Um, in my own teaching, I, I try to see everyone once a week. Um, I teach people over the Internet. So the best thing for my personal preference is to be able to see the student every week because then I can monitor their progress and see if they've forgotten to do something. And then I can quickly adjust it. Now, when I was taking lessons from Clark Gordon, I, I wish I could have taken every week, but at the time that I was taking from him, he he would be one week in Northern California and a couple weeks in S Southern California and then back and then a week off. So I would take one really long lesson for a month and he'd load me up on everything I'm supposed to do for a month. And I had to really pay attention to what I was supposed to do on every week. But for most people, it's like you get off from that time and you'll forget things. So I like, I myself would like to be reminded on a regular basis.